Good morning. If you have your Bible, please open it with me to John chapter 8 in a message I'm calling Jesus and the Adulterous Woman. And as we'll see in a moment, that's how she's defined before she meets Jesus. After she meets Jesus, I think we should call her the Forgiven Woman. Now, before we read our passage, I want to answer a question that you might have. In many of your Bibles, you probably have a footnote letting you know that this passage isn't something that's found in some of our oldest manuscripts that we've discovered. Uh, Now, I don't feel the need to dive into the complexities of textual variances today, but the main question is, is this God's Word? And I believe it is. Uh, Now, I'm not so sure it was in John's original gospel, but I think it was inserted into John's gospel fairly early, maybe even by John himself. Now, some ancient manuscripts place this into Luke chapter 21, so there's a little confusion about where exactly it belongs, but this much is clear. It's been viewed by, uh, as the inspired Word of God for centuries, for the majority of Christians throughout church history. Now, if you're still a little bit skeptical, take comfort. There's no new theology that we gain from this passage. This story is classic Jesus. And the, sto- the truths that we glean from it uh, are taught over and over again throughout the New Testament. Now, I want us to begin by reading the story in its entirety, beginning in John chapter 8, verse 1. It says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him. And he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the ground with his finger as though he didn't hear him. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw the stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. This is a, a beautiful, beautiful encounter of Jesus and a beautiful picture of God's grace. Jesus gets up early in the morning. He comes off the Mount of Olives. He goes into the temple, and the crowds follow behind. He sits down to the temple as the custom would be for a teaching rabbi of the day, and he starts teaching, and the people gather around. Now, in the middle of his lesson, the religious leaders of the day, they barge in, making a huge scene, dragging with them this poor woman. And they place this woman in the the midst of all of them, and they confront Jesus. They say, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery, and the law of Moses says she should be stoned. But what do you say? Now, in verse number 6, we see that they were trying to trap Jesus to find a way to accuse him either to the Jews or to the Romans. If Jesus says to not stone her, they will accuse him of violating the Mosaic law. But if he says to stone her, they will accuse him of violating the Roman law, which didn't allow the Jews to carry out capital punishment without their blessing. He also, if he had said that, would have lost favor with the people who saw him as a leader of compassion. So this really is a gotcha question, but Jesus sees right through the trap. He knew the law said that both the man and the woman caught in adultery must be brought to be stoned, but the man is nowhere to be found who was involved in this act. Only the woman was drugged to Jesus. So Jesus quickly sees this has, this has nothing to do with upholding the law. They're simply using this woman as a pawn in their scheme, as a pawn in their game. So I think looking at the scorn in their eyes and perhaps looking at the shame and the embarrassment of the woman's eyes, Jesus kneels down on the ground and he begins to write in the dirt 
with his finger as if he didn't even hear him. Now, the question is, what in the world did he write in the ground? Well, the truth is we simply don't know. Some have said that perhaps he wrote the Ten Commandments. Others have suggested that he wrote, if a man looks upon a woman with lust, he's committed adultery in his heart. We're not exactly sure what he wrote. But as he's writing, the men kept pressing him for a response, for an answer. And so Jesus stands back up to his feet, and he says to him, he who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And then Jesus kneels back to the ground, and he starts writing again. Now, perhaps this time he writes some specific sins in their own life. Now, one by one, the rocks begin to drop, and they leave the temple. The oldest man there, having experienced more life, he's the first to leave. And then on down the line, all down to the youngest, they all drop the rocks, and they leave out of the temple. Here's the first thing that we clearly learn from Jesus. We are all sinners deserving of death. That really is the point that Jesus is making. Everyone in the temple that day was a sinner except for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus doesn't have time, uh, doesn't have to really take time to convince this woman she was a sinner because she knew she was a sinner. She knew it. But the self righteous Pharisees, they were acting like they didn't have any sin. But Jesus knew all about the darkness of their heart, He knew the hidden secret sins of their heart, and He wanted them to think about it as well. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Whether it's an adulterous woman or whether it's the religious elite, all of us have sinned. Since the fall of Adam and Eve, sin has been a universal problem for humanity. We've all been infected by sin, and each and every one of us that has received that infection know that it's an infection that brings death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin brings death, and it brings death every single time. Now, everyone in the temple that day, including this woman, knew she was a sinner, so Jesus didn't really have to address her sin of adultery, but I'm not convinced that's the case in our culture. So, allow me a moment to state a universal spiritual truth. Adultery is sin. And adultery is sin every time. It's always sin. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 4, marriage is to be honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators, that's sex before marriage, and adulterers, God will judge. You see, God created sex as a good and a a wonderful gift for a husband and a wife to share with one another, but a good thing in the wrong place is often a bad thing, right? For example, you know, a campfire is a wonderful thing on a cold night in the mountains, but if that fire jumped out of the campfire and into the forest, suddenly something wonderful becomes devastating and destructive. God's Word teaches very clearly that sex was created for a designed area, and it's only to be enjoyed within the confines of its design, which is marriage. If it jumps outside of its design, it brings destruction. Outside, sex outside of marriage brings pain. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23, or verse 32 says, whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. You see, adultery brings destruction to everyone who's connected to it. The seventh commandment is, thou shalt not commit adultery. And that commandment actually is for our own good and the good of society. Because adultery kills. It it kills everything in its, its path. It kills relationships, and it kills the joy and the peace in one's own life. Now, many people tempt to minimize their adultery by saying, it was an affair, like, like it was something exciting or mysterious, but I don't care how you couch it and how you phrase it, it brings pain. I've counseled with countless adulterers and adulteresses who, when you really boil it down, they don't believe they're responsible for their sin. It's their spouse's fault. If I had a better husband, if I, if I had a better wife, and sometimes the truth is they may not have a very good spouse. It might, they might have a downright rotten spouse. But while that might provide some context 
for their temptation. It does not excuse adultery. I'm sure you remember the old nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty. I'm not exactly sure what Humpty Dumpty is. Was he like a, you know, a fragile egg, but he's like his human features, if you've ever seen the cartoon drawings of him. But the rhyme goes, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Well, I recently heard about a guy who saw some graffiti on a, in a subway that said, Humpty Dumpty was pushed. <laughs> well, that's our culture, isn't it? it? It wasn't that Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall and got a little too close to the edge. It was that he was pushed off the edge. Well, you may attempt to explain away your responsibility of adultery, but you cannot explain away the shattered life that adultery brings. Please do not buy the the, the lie that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. Oh, it might look greener. In some ways, it might be greener, but that doesn't mean it still won't kill you. I remember one day working out on the farm with my dad and my papa. It had been a very dry year, a drought, and the cows had eaten down the grass of the pasture until it was nearly dirt. But right on the other side of the fence, in the ditch along the road, was this tall grass. As a little guy, it was up over my head. And I looked at the cows, and it looked like, at least I imagined they were thinking, staring longingly at that grass on the other side of the fence, right? So one day I said to my dad, I said, Dad... Why don't we just let the cows out of the pasture to eat the grass along the side of the roads for a while? We'll get some good grazing, and then we'll put the cows back after they've eaten it. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, well, the cows would absolutely love that, but it would kill them. Because, son, you see, that right there in the ditch is called Johnson grass. And if cows eat too much Johnson grass, their stomachs bloat and they die. You see, sometimes it's helpful to know what will kill you, what kind of grass is going to kill you. Sexual sin is like Johnson grass. Oh, the grass might look greener over with that guy. Oh, it might look greener over with that girl, but it's not. It brings pain. It brings death. It brings destruction into every meaningful relationship that you have. Now, back to our passage for a moment. After everyone left, the temple that day, it was just this lady and Jesus, one on one. And Jesus said, woman, we could think of it as man, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And so Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Now here's the principle. We are saved by God's grace. Amen? Only by God's amazing grace. Now, some have accused Jesus of making light of adultery by letting her go without any punishment or or, or judgment or consequences, but that's not at all what Jesus was doing. Well, well, no one and none of the religious uh, leaders and elite were, were worthy to cast a stone. Jesus was worthy to cast a stone because she was guilty, right? She had committed adultery. She had broken her marital vows. She had brought pain certainly to her husband and her kid. She was guilty, and Jesus is the judge. But Jesus was not letting this woman's sin go unpunished. He knew her sin would be paid for and judged by death, but it wouldn't be stoning. It would be a cross. And this woman wouldn't pay for her own adultery. Jesus was going to pay for it instead. So Jesus is not making light of her sin. He's going to go to the cross for her sin. What Jesus is doing is he's giving what the Bible calls grace, unmerited favor. Now, why in the world did Jesus give her grace? Because he loved her. He looked at this woman full of pain. She's broken. Why else would you go uh, have an affair and, and commit adultery? She's broken. Something's not right. He sees her pain, and he has compassion on her, and he loves her just like he loves you in your sin, and he gives her grace. You see, God loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins to take our place of judgment. That's the good news of the Bible. Now, anyone in all who make it to heaven 
will only be there because Jesus looks upon their sinful life, just like he did this woman, and he says, neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Romans chapter 8, verse number 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. If you are in Christ and you've given your life to Him, there is no condemnation in your life. doesn't matter what is in your past, what is in your life, there's no condemnation. Why? We are saved by God's amazing grace. Now, it's not grace, but it's a little bit of our own effort or a little bit of our own doing. No, it's grace alone. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, then not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, the question is, how did this lady receive God's grace? Well, she believed. She believed. God's grace is always given by means of faith. Ephesians 2, verse number 8 again, for by grace you have been saved through faith, through faith. You see, we receive God's grace through faith in Jesus, and, it's, and through faith in Jesus alone. You say, well, well, pastor, there's no record of this lady believing. Well, read a little closer. Look a little closer. Jesus asks her, is there anyone who condemns? And what is she, how does she respond? She says, no one, Lord. No one, Lord. Lord. She calls Jesus Lord. At some point during this whole encounter, Jesus had moved from rabbi in her mind and in her heart to now Jesus is her Lord. Maybe it was something that he wrote in the ground. Maybe it was the way in which he loved her and, sh- and protected her like she had never been protected before. But she believes upon him and she calls him Lord. We must also call Jesus Lord. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse number 9, that if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you'll be saved. So, so how do you receive the forgiveness of God? I mean, maybe you're listening to this message today and you're weighed by sin. Maybe it's adultery. Maybe it's something very different, but you know you're weighed down by some sin in your life. How do you receive the forgiveness of God like this woman? Well, it's very simple. You confess in faith that Jesus is Lord. You say, Lord Jesus, And you believe in your heart that he paid for the sins, your sins on the cross, and was raised on the third day. If you do that, you will be forgiven in a moment. In a moment. You say, well, pastor, is it really that easy? It is. This woman, read the passage. She didn't have to clean up her life in order to be forgiven. No, all she had to say is, Lord, Jesus, you're my Lord. And he forgave her. Now, he didn't just forgive her, did he? He gave her a gift that was on top of the forgiveness. He gave her a command that would be a blessing in her life. He said, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Here's the principle. We are changed by God's grace. When we encounter the grace of God, it it changes us. We are different. God's grace changes us. When the Spirit of God touches a person and brings life, He changes that person. Jesus doesn't just forgive forgive her and let her go back to her painful adultery? No, 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 no. He says, now go and sin no more. Don't, 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 don't involve yourself in that lifestyle anymore. We looked at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 earlier, but I want us to look at the very next verse, verse number 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. The result of grace is good works. Now, you, you might be struggling today, though, with this little command that Jesus said, now go and sin no more. Maybe you've experienced this forgiveness in your life as a believer, but that no and go and sin no more thing, is tri- you're tripped up. Somehow you're not living in victory of obedience. Maybe your marriage is on the rocks and you're thinking the grass is greener on the other side. Maybe pornography has gripped your life in such a way that that it's probably only a matter of time until it becomes full-fledged adultery. And even if it doesn't result in physical adultery, Jesus said if you look upon a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. So maybe you're struggling with sexual sin. Maybe you're struggling with some other kind of a sin. How do you go and sin no more? How do you change? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 11 speaks of our struggle. 
He says, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. There's a war going on in each side of each one of us, that, that which our flesh wants and that which the Spirit wants. Well, how do we starve the flesh and how do we feed the Spirit? How do we guard ourselves from adultery and sexual sin? A few points of application. First thing is this. Please embrace God's perspective on sex. The mind. Romans 12 says, don't be conformed to this world, that's the world's thinking, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Jesus said in John 17, verse number 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. We are sanctified or changed and transformed by the truth of God's word. If you allow your thinking and worldview on sex to be formed or conformed by movies, social media, by music, by you name it, you have no chance. You have no chance to live in sexual freedom and obedience. You will be a slave to those unnatural and ungodly and lifeful appetites that the world throws at you. We must all make a decision in our life regarding sex. Are we going to embrace what God says about it, or are we going to embrace what the world says about it? Another way of saying that is, are we going to believe what God says, or are we going to believe what the world is saying? Now, in order to beat sexual temptation, we've got to allow God to rewire our brains that have been warped and conformed by the world. Scientific studies show that pornography literally and physiologically rewires the brain. Another way of saying that is that pornography causes disorder in the brain. It inflicts sexual dis dysfunction, we know, in, in many people. It brings health, mental health crisis and health issues. But when a person meets Jesus, and when Jesus looks upon them and says, neither do I condemn you, now go and sin no more, the Holy Spirit is given to a person, and He begins a great work in their heart and in their mind. But here's the deal. We, got, we have to submit to His Word. He expects and commands us to cooperate with the heavy lifting He's doing. And that means we've got to embrace what He says about our sexual life, His perspective. Now, here's the deal. For decades in our country, unbelievers, they knew God's perspective on sex, even if maybe they didn't follow God's perspective. But today, many don't even know. They don't even know. We deal with people almost on a weekly basis who are giving their lives to Jesus, and they're wanting to get right with God, and then we'll notice that they're living together, and they're not married. And, and so what do we do? We do the most loving thing we could we could possibly do for them. We share with them God's best for them regarding their sex life. And here's the deal. Most are so very thankful. They hadn't really thought about it. They didn't think it was that big a deal. Why? Because their mind has been conformed to the world. But now that they're aware, they're like, okay, thank you. But did you know some are upset? <laughs> some are angry with the conversation. Now, oftentimes it's initial angry, uh, anger, and then the Holy Spirit gets the best of them, and, 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 and He does a great work in them. But did you know sometimes that anger never goes away? They're just mad and upset with us. Now, when that anger continues, it's a sign that they want to be forgiven without being changed. It's a sign that they want Jesus to look on them in their adultery and say, neither do I condemn you. Now go back to your adultery and fornication. But that's not biblical faith. That's a counterfeit faith. Because faith, and we receive God's grace, and that brings transformation. So the first step of application is make to resolve in your heart and in your mind to do things God's way. That's just what you're going to do. Because you can trust His perspective. I promise you. Now we must also recognize that we're, we're all vulnerable. To sexual sin. We're all vulnerable. I, no one is beyond this sin. I don't care if you're Mother Teresa or Billy Graham, you're vulnerable. Billy Graham had famously what was called the Billy Graham rule, which stated that he would not allow himself to be alone with a woman other than his wife. Now, why in the world did Billy Graham have a rule like that? Well, because he knew he was vulnerable. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 12, therefore let him who thinks he stands Take heed lest he fall. 
We're all vulnerable. If you don't recognize you're vulnerable, you won't properly guard yourself. Now, another thing that will help you is count the cost of sexual sin. There's always a cost. If you sin sexually, you're going to pay much more than you want to pay. It is important to learn to count that cost. What, what are you going to have to pay? Nearly 15 years ago now, on a Sunday evening, Pastor Gary Mathena was preaching about the dangers of sexual sin and adultery, and he asked us to consider what would happen in our life in the fallout if we committed adultery. And so I took his assignment ser- seriously, and that night I got out a piece of paper and I, I wrote down all the consequences I could think of in my life. What might happen if I had an affair? And I filled up the front page of that paper and I flipped it over and I, I filled out the back page of that paper. And I showed Kelsey the paper and she taped it to the inside stock drawer of my, my sock drawer so I'd see it every day. <laughs> well, we moved about a year ago and the first day we moved in, I opened my brand new drawer, and there it was, taped to the inside of my drawer. She's not going to let me forget. What would happen if you ever go outside of the marriage, right? Now, I read that paper again this week in preparation for today about the, the hypothetical devastation that would take place in my life. Now, I I'm not, don't have time for the specifics, but you want to know the, the basic gist of what I wrote down. I wrote about how an affair would damage and cripple every relationship that's meaningful to me. It would hurt my beloved wife, Kelsey, whom I love so very much. It would hurt my kids. I only had one at the time. It would hurt my parents and siblings. It would hurt Valley Baptist Church. It would hurt my ministry. It would hurt me. And most of all, it would hurt and grieve our God, the one who bought me with the price of the blood of his son, it would hurt the heart of God. We would all be wise. You would be wise to get out a piece of paper and to count the cost of sexual sin in your life as a believer. Now, we must also learn to flee and to run from sexual temptation. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, flee sexual immorality. Run from it. You remember Joseph in the book of Genesis? Joseph's one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament. There was a time in Joseph's life as a young single man that, that his master's wife, Potiphar's wife, threw herself at him in trying to seduce him. She was very forward. She said, lie with me, sleep with me. Now, can you imagine being a young single guy in a foreign country, this beautiful and powerful woman throws herself at you? It must have been tempting for Joseph in some ways, but Joseph says no. And then, and then she throws herself at him again, and this time she grabs a hold of his clothes, and she yanks his garments off, and this time Joseph doesn't explain anything to her. He just runs. He literally runs out of the house. Did you know that some temptations are so powerful they require us to literally run away, to run out of whatever situation that we find ourselves in. And sexual sin is that kind of a, a, a temptation to run out of the room. Now, fleeing sexual immorality in our culture is challenging, but it's not impossible. We've got to learn how to avoid temptation, whether it's not being alone with, with someone other than our spouse uh, of the opposite sex, or it's putting a filter on our internet devices, or just making a decision. I don't care how great that show is or how great that movie is. If it has sexual garbage, we're not going to take it in our minds. We have got to learn how to avoid and run away from sexual temptation because we're vulnerable. Now, here's the last application. It is the very most important point, so do not miss this one. Live your life by the Spirit of God. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. I say then, walk. Walk is a metaphor for live. Live in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I remember as a young Christian man in the early years of puberty and adolescence, of having some strong physical di- desires, but not yet being married. And so, for years, I battled those desires with willpower. Even 
even for a time after I got married, my strategy was willpower against lust. I'm going to, I, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And it was this willpower thing. And sadly, I lost far more battles than I should have lost with lust. It was not until I learned that the flesh is only overcome by the Spirit that I started to live in consistent victory in my life. Living by His Spirit and His power will give you a predisposition to obey. Because He rewires our desires and our want to in such a way that we're walking with Him on a consistent and daily basis. And now, the desires I had, they're, they're fleeting, and now I just want to please Him. Now, as we begin wrapping up, it's very important that we address this question. What if you identify with this woman more than the religious elite? <laughs> Maybe you're not the one that is needing scolded by Jesus not to be casting stone. Maybe that's you, but maybe you find yourself as the woman, as an adulterer, as an adulteress. What do you do? What do you do? Here's what you do. You call upon Jesus in faith. You say, Jesus, I don't want my sin to be Lord anymore. I want you to be Lord. And then you experience his overwhelming love and the grace and the forgiveness that he offers you. And then you go and you sin no more. You see, adultery is not the end of your life. No, not at all. King David in the Old Testament, one of the most godly men that certainly we all look to, a man of faith. He was said to be a man after God's own heart, yet there was a time in his life when he went out on a rooftop and he glanced over at a neighbor's house, and on the roof of his neighbor's house was a, was a beautiful woman taking a bath. And instead of running away like Joseph did, he lusted for her. And he called for her and he slept with her. Now, it's a long story, but she got pregnant, and David tried to cover up his sin by having her husband killed on the battlefield, and eventually the prophet Nathan, Nathan confronted David over his sin, and David felt convicted, and he cried out to God for mercy and forgiveness. You can read all about it in Psalm 51. It's a beautiful prayer of repentance, and what did God do? God forgave him. God gave him grace, and did you know that God forgave him completely? I find it interesting that David is mentioned over 50 times in the New Testament. And did you know that not one of those times, not one time does the Holy Spirit bring up David's sin of adultery in the New Testament? It's not there. Why? Because God forgave him and put it out of his mind. He forgave him completely and put it out of his mind. Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, their sin. In their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. God's forgiveness is complete. Look at Micah chapter 7, verse number 19. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. That's exactly what Jesus did for this woman who had just been caught in the act of adultery. He takes her sin and he casts them into the depths of the sea. And that's exactly what he'll do for you. If you come to him in faith and call upon him as Lord, he will take your sin and he will remember them no more. Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom said, God buries our sins in the depths of the sea, and then he stakes up a sign that says, no fishing allowed. <laughs> Isn't that what he does? Let me ask you, has God forgiven you? If you've ever placed your faith and trust in Jesus, he has forgiven you. So let me ask you another question. Do you ever go fishing for past sins he's already dealt with? Please, don't go fishing for your sins that Jesus has already paid for on the cross and you have already done business with God about. Now, for a moment to go back to Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. 
All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Maybe today you feel like Humpty Dumpty. You've fallen. And your life is shattered into pieces. Maybe it's not adultery in your case. Maybe it's anger and it's caused pain in your life and so many others that you love. Maybe it's greed. The list is long. But some sin, and it, it, it's, it's shattered your life. Maybe you got a little too close to the edge. Maybe, in fact, you were pushed. Either way, your life is broken. It's in shambles. It's in pieces. And you know it, and this nursery rhyme is ringing true for your life today. Listen, there is no one on this earth that can take the pieces of your life and put them back together. No one. Your spouse can't do it. Your mistress can't. Your therapist can't. Your pastor can't. Only Jesus can put you back together. Only Jesus can reach into your failure and, and the darkest, worst thing you've ever done in your life, and can say, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. My forgiveness is complete. I cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. I put it in the depths of the sea. I remember it no more. So what do you do if you find yourself in sin today? Uh, call upon the Lord Jesus in faith, and he will forgive you, and he'll take all the pieces of your broken life. And he will make you whole. Amen? Well, let's bow together in an attitude of prayer. I want to invite you to give your life to Christ here in just a moment. Maybe God is tugging on your heart. Maybe it's sexual sin. Maybe it's not. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all sinners. For one person it's one thing, for another it's another. Our sin separates us from God. Really it means that our, our relationship and fellowship with Him has, have been broken so that we feel distance and there's actually enmity. That's why Jesus came. He, he didn't go around forgiving sin that wouldn't be paid for. No, he came to pay for it. That's why he can be good and say, you're forgiven. <laughs> Jesus wants to do that in your life. I truly believe that. Maybe God is stirring in your heart in a special way today. I want to invite you to give your life to him. and Just come to him and say, I, I want to turn from my sin and turn to Christ. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. It just means you're making a decision to trust Jesus instead of yourself. He's going to help you along the way. That's a process. But why don't you begin it today by placing your faith in Jesus? Maybe you're a believer and you've drifted from the Lord. And today, God is saying, come back to me. Go and sin no more. Let me help you. Let me help clean up your life. Whatever it might be, I want to invite you to come to these steps and pour out your heart to the Lord. Maybe, maybe for someone you love to come pray for them. And maybe your spouse, maybe your kids, maybe a neighbor. Maybe someone in your life group that's really struggling to come and pray. Or maybe to take one of these pastors or prayer partners by the hand and to say, would you pray with me? We would love to pray with you. Maybe you want to rededicate your life to the Lord or join our church family, become a member or, or say, I want to be baptized. Whatever it is, let us know and we want to help you, all right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace. Lord, in our culture, it seems at times like it's impossible to remain pure sexually. We thank you, Lord, that that is not the case. And there are many that can testify, Lord, of what you 
do in our hearts in such a way that that we start to live in, in victory. I pray that you give us wisdom to avoid sin, all of those things, Lord. But really, this is a message, I think, Lord, to, to us, to twofold, not to cast stones at others that fail, but also, Lord, to recognize that even the worst of our sin can be forgiven by you in a moment. Lord, I pray that you would do a work of, on both groups of people, any of us that are so quick to throw stones, Lord, may you remind us today that we are all failures in need of grace. And the person that needs your grace so desperately, Lord, may you show show them that it's available. And I also pray for the person or the people that have been wounded by others' sexual sin. And their pain is so great. Their pain is overwhelming in some ways. Lord, would you give them the grace that they need to heal and the grace that they need to extend to whoever, extend grace to whoever has harmed them. Help us, Lord Jesus, do a great work in our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.